Today I'm going to talk to you about Las Rastiadoras, which is a group in Mexico of women digging the ground looking for the bodies of their missing loved ones. This isn't a true crime story per se, but I wanted to create a video to demonstrate what women are willing to do to find their loved ones and also help cope with their loss. This story is both beautiful and tragic and I just felt a need to tell you. Now I don't have many or any footage of the people in question in this story but a lot of the stock images and the stock footages you will see is of other women in Mexico looking for their missing loved ones. That's just a heads up so please be content with this mug. So we start with Blanca Soto. The last time she saw her husband he blew her a kiss. It was the morning of November 28, 2016. Her husband Camilo was headed to Los Mochis, a city southwest of San Blas, a town in the Mexican state of Sinaloa where Camilo and his wife Blanca lived. Camilo that day told his wife that she didn't need to run errands with him, she could stay home. Blanca did insist though, why don't you drive me as far as you can go to the local tailors and then I can walk back. When they arrived at 9am, something told Blanca, don't get outside of the truck. But she did anyway, she got outside, stepped on the ground and closed the door. Blanca recounts, I remember he was looking at me. He didn't leave right away, he just kept looking at me. Camilo, the husband, pressed his fingers on his lips and then pressed them on his wife's lips. Blanca moved to try and get back into the truck but Camilo had already had his eyes on the road and then off he went and he drove away. But when Blanca returned home that morning, she started to feel a sickness inside of her. She felt a pain in her chest and then vomit came up and up. Later, she would think to herself, this was a foreboding, this was a warning. She went to bed and when she woke up a few hours later, Camilo hadn't returned. Blanca called his cell phone, he didn't answer. She left a voicemail and eventually she got no answers. Blanca and Camillo had three sons so she called one of her sons and the sons tried to reach out to the father to no avail. Blanca called her mother and her father and they tried to reach out to Camillo but they heard nothing. Nobody knew where he was, nobody could get in contact with him and this was very strange considering that Camillo would always be in contact with Blanca. Blanca then went to the police where they told her you have to wait 48 hours before filing a missing persons report. But then she gave them her husband's name, Camilo, who happened to be a police officer and as a favour to her, they filled out a report. They take a statement from her, then Blanca goes home waiting for a phone call. But the authorities did not call her and Camilo did not call her. See when people vanish in Sinaloa, they are almost never seen again. Sometimes drug cartels are responsible, sometimes state security is responsible. Often the two sides are colluding, the drug cartels and the state security forces are known to be corrupt. There are many reasons why people are taken. Some are taken because they work for the cartels, others are taken because they refuse to. Some buy drugs, some sell them, some get in the way, some are members of gangs, some are enemies. There are a whole host of reasons why people in Sinaloa and Mexico in general just randomly disappear. In the aftermath of his disappearance and the days and the weeks after, Blanca would wake up every morning with the feeling that she would see his dead body dumped at the front of their house. In fact, she considered leaving town and seeking political asylum in America. But the desire to find her husband kept her in San Blas. She tried to move forward in small ways. She rearranged the furniture in the house. She sold some of her husband's clothes. She changed the bed and her house, you know, as a way to cope. She purchased new appliances. She would cook a lot more and she would hope that keeping herself busy, she would find it therapeutic in mourning the loss of her husband. Pork pozole, which is a dark rich stew, was her husband's favourite meal. He liked it spicy, the hotter the better. He preferred it most when he had a lot to drink, as he did the night before his disappearance. It was what he ate to nurse a hangover. Blanca knew the ingredients by heart, pork ribs, beef, cilantro, hominy, boyon, 
garlic and onion. But upon his disappearance, Blanca never made pozole ever again. By the way, forgive me for my mispronunciations. She missed Camillo's presence in the kitchen. How, when sometimes when they would cook together, he'd put her hands on her hips, his chin on the back of her shoulders. Put more chilies in it. Why don't you add more salt? The normal, everyday, run-of-the-mill things couples do. She missed how he would lift her hair and blow on her neck. So Camillo had become one of more than 90,000 sons, husbands, fathers, wives, daughters and mothers haunting Mexico. They are known as Los Desperacidos or otherwise known as the Disappeared. See, one of the biggest problems for Blanca was closure. She didn't know why her husband disappeared. She doesn't know what he'd done or who captured him and this just ate away at her every single day. It got to the point where she did not want to know the reasons anymore. She stopped caring on the why and she just wanted to find Camilo so you can start grieving properly. See, enforced disappearances, which is the legal term for abduction of individuals and the concealment of their whereabouts have plagued Latin America countries for decades. The syntax of the problem is strained by necessity. People don't disappear, which implies they have a choice in the matter. Rather, they are disappeared by forces outside of their control. See, in Mexico, more than 90% of disappearances have occurred after 2006. This was the year President Felipe Calderon enlisted the military to fight the drug cartels. Today, a maelstrom of gang and cartel conflicts, as well as government and police corruption, continues to sweep up civilians. Most of them are poor and male. Impunity exacerbates the problem. According to national figures, there was roughly 7,000 disappearances in 2019, but only 351 legal cases were open, to which only two people were prosecuted. In contrast to Mexico's highly visible violence, bodies are strung up on bridges or they're left mutilated on the roadside as a means of intimidation. This is a message that is being sent from one gang or cartel to another. But that's the dilemma with disappearances. You can't even say, is this a message to other gang members or other drug cartels or even to the government for you don't know where the body is and you don't know what happened. Disappearances leave only questions in their wake. One day a person is there, the next day they're gone. Their loved ones are left to search for something, anything, something tangible to mourn, something to help them make it make sense. See today, burial is seen as the final physical act of tenderness the living can offer the dead. It provides a sense of completion in a way it's saying that you've accompanied someone as far down the road of their life as you can. See, the death of a loved one and then the funeral, they enshrine stories of faith, love and sorrow. And graves offer the grieving a place they can return to again and again. This is the double cruelty of enforced disappearance. First comes the loss of life, then comes the denial of burying the body with dignity. But in Sinaloa, there is a woman-led collective determined to reclaim the chance. They call themselves Las Rastiadoras del Fuerte, which in English is the trackers of El Fuerte. They are a part of a long legacy of civilian women in Mexico campaigning to find the disappeared. Rosara Ibarra was actually the pioneer. Her son in 1975 Nueve Leon, he disappeared. He was an activist. He was apparently abducted by state police when Rosario started searching for him. Along with other mothers and wives, she formed Committee Eureka del Desperacidos, which in other words is the Eureka Committee of the Disappeared. This committee demanded investigations and justice. Remember earlier I mentioned that only 351 investigations were launched? Well, she wanted more. Unfortunately for Rosario, 46 years after her son vanished, he was still missing to this day. And in Mexico, there are over 60 civilian groups searching whichever town or city they're in, finding the disappearance of their loved ones. And Las Rastiadoras 
is one of them and they were formed in 2014. It has around 200 members. Most of them are women from El Fuerte and El Fuerte is a municipality in northern Sinaloa. They've all been touched in some way by enforced disappearances. A lot of them have lost their husbands and their sons. See, criminal groups in Mexico dispose of bodies in different ways. Some burn them, some dissolve them in acid. In El Fuerte, the disappeared, they tend to be buried in unmarked graves in the countryside. So Las Rastradoras, they search the landscape with basic tools, shovels, machetes, spades, and picks. The women dig in dry earth, knowing that to properly bury their dead, they must unbury them first. See, they don't call what they're looking for dead bodies or corpses or remains. They refer to them as treasures. Blanca first heard about this group before Camillo had even disappeared. Blanca said she felt admiration for them at the same time she felt sad. And once her husband was gone, she was scared to join them. See, Blanca was paranoid that her life would be in danger if she joined this group and she kept thinking of her three sons in case anything happened to her. She was wary that if she was to draw attention to herself through public advocacy, then those who took her husband may well come and take her. Twice a week on Wednesdays and Sundays, the group would scour the city looking for treasures, or as me and you would call it, human remains. Women who have yet to find their loved ones when they travel together in the cities looking for the human remains, they'd all wear the same t-shirt. And this t-shirt would say, I will search for you until I find you. But there was a few within the group who had already found their loved ones. So they would wear a t-shirt with the words printed, promise fulfilled. Now Myrna Medina is the founder of Las Rastreadoras. She was a retired school teacher and she had an uncanny memory for dates. She remembered everything. It was said that in the group, Myrna Medina would remember the names and the dates of every missing person. See, Myrna's own date was July the 10th. That was the day her own son Roberto went missing. And then three years after the date he vanished, Myrna eventually found the remains of her son. She found some vertebrae from his back and she found a shard that went into one of his bones. DNA analysis confirmed that this indeed were the remains of Roberto. And at that time, Roberto had been the 93rd body recovered by Las Rastradoras. Again, I am not saying that name properly, so forgive me for the pronunciation. And I think what allowed Myrna to remember every date and all the names and and this is this is testament to her passion for the group was that having found her son she was able to give her the proper burial that she craved and it provided her closure so i think for this group to have their leader know what it's like to lose someone find someone and then close that chapter in their life she would know better than anyone what this means to all the other women still grieving. Now Las Rastriadoras, they receive regular tips on where some bodies may be buried. Sometimes this information is shared anonymously or sometimes they get it from the police. In other cases, local residents, they spot something suspicious such as a patch of turned soil. And with this, the group go to that location and they are often accompanied by armed security. They dig the earth with their tools, then plunge metal construction rods into the ground. When they pull the rods up, the tips are caked in soil. And by lifting it up, the women then sniff the lingering dirt and they can tell the difference between human remains and animal remains. See, Maria Lugo, who is a woman in the group, uh, they call her Mankey in the group, she searched for her son, Juan Francisco, since June the 19th, 2015. A photo of his face dangles from a silver chain she has around her neck. She is the oldest woman in the group, but she is known for her specific sense of smell. And with the help of a rod, Mankey can tell that when she smells the soil, she knows exactly whether it's humans or animal remains. She's probably the most accurate of all of them in the group. See, sometimes a heavy smell of sewage and meat touches her nostrils. To this, it's the smell of death. And with this smell, the group, they start digging. Mankey says 
that the smell of human flesh is a lot more penetrating in comparison to an animal carcass. Many women in the group can't handle the smell, but Mankey went on to say that this is something I have to do as this could be one of our children. And whenever they find something or whenever they find a treasure, they wait. They stand over the site and then they say a prayer before they dig and look even deeper. And if they do find something, bones or something of that nature, they then give it over to the local authorities who can then conduct DNA analysis. And of course, with this, the women hope it can match to one of the children or husband or, or uncles or whoever has gone missing. And to this day, Las Rastriodoras are currently looking for over 1,500 people. See, many of those who are missing are the relatives and friends of the group, but there's also a large portion of names and dates they are looking for where local residents have said, please help me find my loved one. Now on her first dig, Blanca, she wasn't sure what to do. She didn't know how to use the tools. She was scared of any snakes around her and she was just bemused by the odor of death. I went in eagerly and weak, she said. She also went on to say, I'm not someone that goes out much. See, when they went on their searches, the other women, they teased Blanca as she turned up with gloves and an umbrella. This was to avoid the scorching Sinaloa sun. When Myrna gave her a spade, she dug it into the ground so hard that it bounced back up, it hit her in the chest, and then she just started crying. Blanca's first search was a negative, which is what the group would describe where they find a site that is suspicious, but then nothing comes up. But her second was a positive. See, the group they found a body. This body was lying in its fetal position with most of the body still intact. The impression was something horrible, Blanca said. When she saw the corpse, the air left her lungs and she just fell backward. Other women who were more seasoned in the tracking would go, catch her and lift her up. They gave Blanca an inhaler to help her calm down so she could gather her senses and then just start breathing normally. Week in and week out, Blanca would be with the group and she kept learning and learning on how to find her husband. See, while she was digging different sites at different times and honing her skills with a spade, there was something else she was realizing and that was how to cope with loss. So looking at all the other women who had looked for their lo loved ones a lot longer than Blanca had, she realized that time was the healer. See, Juana Barreras, she was another member of the group. She lost her son, Adrian. He disappeared in August of 2018. In Juana's words, her son was a Robin Hood. He would rescue stray dogs. He was the kind where if it was cold, he'd give his sweaters to others. The last time Juana saw Adrian, he was on a bike. He had left the house to go and deliver cigarettes to someone. But as soon as he leaves, Joanna hears gunshots. She felt her lungs constrict. She runs outside and she says, Adrian, Adrian, as she sees her son running towards her. He was being chased by a man with a gun. And as he's running towards her, he turns and then she loses sight of both the gunman and Adrian. She then hears gunshots coming from one area and she runs towards that part. As she's running towards the sound, she sees a truck coming out skidding along and she can smell the rubber of the tires and then she hears a neighbor and the neighbor is shouting they killed him they killed him there was blood on the streets where the trucks were coming from see the neighbor he told juanma that adrian was abducted the truck the drivers of the truck said get in we need you to do a job he refused he got out he escaped so they chased him and upon catching up to him they took his life and Juanma, she had nobody to talk to. She couldn't go to the police because a lot of them are corrupt. She couldn't go to the cartel because they couldn't care less. And she was just stuck in limbo. None of this made sense. She needed closure. If we go back to Maki, her son Juan Francisco, who was 33 years old, he was also taken. He one day was installing lights at a job site to which a truck came and kidnapped him. It was a red truck. It pulled up. The co-workers ran away because they knew what this truck meant. In the area, enforced disappearances were on the rise. Juan Francisco tried to run, but he had an injured knee 
and he didn't get far. They grab him, they put him in the truck, they ask him to do a job and when he refused, they tortured him and they killed him. Manki went to the prosecutor's office but they told her you gotta wait 72 hours before you can file a report. Officials did promise Manki we'll do an investigation, we'll ask questions, we'll ask around but nothing was ever filed. Manki would go back to the police office every week to which they would keep telling her we don't know anything, go away and it was then she realized well, they're not going to do anything for me. And the only one that could find her son is herself. See, Mexico is a country that feeds its dead. Every year, bottles of Fanta and plates of pan dulce and pollo con mole adorn altars on Dia de Muertos, which is the day of the dead. See, food is a way of remembering those and honoring those who've passed away. And with last Rastiodoras, this was no different. For them, it had become something more. The idea to compile a cookbook arose a few years after the group was formed. And together, the women came to a realization as cruel as it was inevitable. The problem with a decade long issue of Los Desperacidos is that the public grows wary of it, of hearing the names of the missing, of fathoming the ever growing numbers, of seeing photos of bodies and watching mothers weep. How then could Las Rastriodoras push back against the erasure of their loved ones? How could the women resist oblivion? Food was the answer. See all the women, their memories tied to their loved ones was their favorite food, their favorite drink, how they liked it. They decided to gather recipes for the dishes of their loved ones. They would invite cookbook readers to taste their loss. It was a way to bond over all of them grieving. The dishes would be proof of lives lived and lost and portals to empathy. What's more, the women would create the book together. They would create something lasting from their collective sorrow. They would transform the mundane act of chopping onions, sifting flour or caramelizing sugar into a sacrament. Joanna contributed her tuna chipotle sandwich. Manki shared her technique of making flan. Myrna, who was the group's leader, she would make pizza dillas, which is tortillas folded over roasted beef. All in all, 27 women shared dishes for the project. And then in 2019, Recetario para la Memoria, the memory recipe book was published. Now on a September night, Blanca laid in bed praying. One of her sons told her, mom, you need to start attending a Pentecostal church. She then started to become a devout believer and she made a prayer. She said, Lord, I am starting to believe. Lord, I feel I am ready. Tomorrow, we're going to go on a search. If you think I'm ready to find him, then please let me find him. When she woke up the next morning, she repeated the prayer. She got dressed and then she waited outside the house. The women arrived in a truck. Blanca climbed in. There wasn't too many women who joined them in the dig that day and they didn't really have a planned search. They were just genuinely looking at an area where they could potentially find something. Then they saw a loose, uh, a piled area of soil. So they got their tools and they started to dig. Myrna was the one who saw the fabric first, buried a few inches beneath the soil. More digging revealed that this fabric was the pants of a man. Myrna then looked at the details a bit more and she said it was Oggy brand, it was black, size 34 and that's when Blanca knew straight away. Blanca shouted, it's him, it's him, it's him. She grabbed a shovel and worked to free the body from the earth's hold. The other women joined her. They then saw socks and a pair of boxes. They saw a torso and a shoulder. However, the body's head was missing. But by this point, Blanca had saw all she needed to see. See, Camillo, before he disappeared, there was a problem with his car, with his seatbelt, and he managed to stain one of his clothing while trying to fix this seatbelt and that same stain was there on his pants when she saw the body. And nine months after Camillo disappeared, Blanca was able to bury her husband. And during the funeral, Myrna and other women were by the side of Blanca. Blanca kept thinking to herself, would her husband be alive if she went back into the truck a second or two earlier than when she tried at the beginning of the story. Blanca went on to say that sometimes when she's cooking and she's thinking of her husband, she stops and she thanks God for how grateful she is. See, her gratitude is the fact that she got to grieve 
mourn and then give her husband the send off she wanted to give while other women are still finding closure. See, Blanca went on to say that she is marveling on what her God has done in the midst of her anguish, in the midst of her pain, in the midst of her sadness and in the midst of her joy. She said that she's done so many things that she wouldn't have done if her husband was here. Meeting these women has changed her life. Now I can't begin to imagine what these women are going through. Imagine if you're looking for the person you love but then other people find theirs. Maybe there's resentment, maybe there's pain and hate and all that stuff that comes with it. I wish they're entitled to feel given the sad, depressing nature of what they're going through. But why don't you guys comment? Tell me what you think.